treatment of the particular area of corruption is extremely difficult, multifaceted, and certainly protean. Thus, for instance, if you want to deal with a manifestation at a level of a municipality in Limpopo, you have certain problems, you certainly have certain factual issues. If you want to deal with it at the level of, of ESCO or, or a, a, a national uh, state-owned enterprise, the approach and the problems are different. So you've got to have a, a, an appreciation of the fact that we are dealing with a, a, a feature that has many different characteristics and requires a very subtle approach, or at least a flexible approach. Also, we must realize that even when you have identified the particular locus of concern, of corruption, dishonesty, fraud, and you may have removed one or two of the key figures responsible, you haven't really got anywhere near solving the problem. Because the rehabilitation of the institution, after you have removed the offending elements, is a difficult, long-term problem, which is accompanied by its very own particular administrative and legal problems. But let's get practical. I've been talking theory. Ask them in Nelson Mandela Bay how many people have been convicted of the hundreds, if not thousands, of manifestations of corruption and fraud. And the answer is simple. The same number as have been successfully prosecuted in Limpopo or in the Free State. Uh, the current score is one million to zero in terms of the batting average of prosecution. Our address to the pervasive and persistent presence of corruption, the lingering effects of state capture is largely complicated by the fact that the state institutions that were designed to prevent and, pro and prosecute these manifestations of dishonesty have themselves been destroyed. The state capture plan at the beginning was devilish in its genius. An, an acupuncturist could not have identified the key pressure points of the body politic more exactly than the planners have done. Each one of the key points of protection for civil society and the integrity of the state were identified and penetrated and captured. Whether it be SARS or the MPA or the Hawks, who were already an emasculated scorpions, uh, whether it's crime intelligence, whether it's the state security agency, each one of these key points was identified and captured. And do not think for one moment, but I think Mr. Kitzbeter would confirm this, Commissioner Kitzbeter, that Tom Moyani was by no means the only needle prick that was put into SARS at the time when it was identified and captured. There are many other points around that single puncture that they made that are also infected. And we don't know how wide that is. In the National Prosecuting Authority, I, I have the deepest sympathy for uh, <coughs> National Director of Public Prosecution toy who deals with lawyers and at the best of times they're not easy people to deal with 
And then the best of times when you are dealing with legal issues and legal opinions and judgments that have got to be made by prosecutors, there are not quite and blacks, clear lines. These are matters of opinion, of judgment, of value. And if you cannot trust the people that you're working with, not only in terms of their professional skill, but in terms of their integrity, you're all at sea. And this is a crucial issue at the management level of the National Prosecuting Authority, one of the most dangerous, pervasive consequences of this successful capture of a state institution. And it's not only at that level. There are clear manifestations that the loss of professional competence in the National Prosecuting Authority, in SARS, in the police, in crime intelligence, in the Hawks, has been deeply corrosive. That you have two or three levels down that have been affected. The poison introduced by the appointees of, uh, of state capture is still there. Not <coughs> all of those who have, were affected have been removed, and those who were not actually dishonest were demoralized, and many of them left the service, and you have a lack of integrity and professional capacity at those levels. So the, the, the poison lingers on. The prosecutorial stasis that we are seeing at the moment is causing all of us concern. We're all upset that we have seen no easy major cases. We want to see people in orange uniforms. We're, we're angry. We're <laughs> expecting this. But for just a moment, let's just be practical. It's a very big gap, a very large gap between a, an investigative journalist finding sufficient facts, sufficient information to be able to publish something defamatory, identifying something criminal having been done by some public official. And the journalist feels that his editor and his legal advisors feel we've got enough to be safe. They can never sue us on this, and this is in the public interest, it's the truth. It's a, a chasm between that and having enough material in order to launch a successful prosecution. The moment Peter Louis Maber writes about particular people in a particular town in the Free State <coughs> telling him certain things about having seen Ace Magashula getting the shell garage for his daughter. <coughs> Those witnesses disappear once you want to go and look for them subsequently. They may have decided that it would be healthier for them to live elsewhere. They may have been advised to that effect that uh, the climate was no longer pleasant for them. They may have been bought, they may have gotten scared, or they may simply have changed their minds. If you want to launch a prosecution of that kind, you've got to have witnesses. You've got to be able to say to, to yourself and your conscience as a prosecutor, I can responsibly launch a prosecution, make allegations of criminality against X and Y and Z, on this evidence that I have. And that is extremely difficult today because a vast body of competent, experienced detectives have given up, have retired, have left, have gone into the private security industry and are simply no longer available to go do the legwork out there. So the rehabilitation of the system at the top level is weakened by the failure to rehabilitate at the purely local administrative level. And that can never be solved in the short term by removing dishonest people 
or by adopting the codes of conduct. People were trained over many years, an ethos was developed over many years. I was personally involved from the very beginning of the National Prosecuting Authority in the training of prosecutors, not only in the mechanics, but in the ethics of the profession, and, the, and, and in the tricks of the trade. Much of that knowledge and much of that ethos has been lost. I can speak of that particular institution with knowledge. I believe that it probably applies to the other institutions that were equally emasculated, hollowed out. I know that in the case of the Hawks, it is certainly so that honest people like Shadrach, Sabir, were replaced by scoundrels. Not only that, but the decent people who used to work with Shadrach, Sabir, have left the service. They're no longer prepared to be there, or they won't. And there has, to date, been no conscious effort to invite them to come back. I'm not sure that that works all that well in the case of <coughs> a hierarchical structure <coughs> like the NF branch of the SAPS, but the fact is that the pervasive poison lingers on. Now, we, we know that the corruption and its agents are, are well entrenched. We know that they're well funded. We know that they're ubiquitous. I'll finish in time. Uh, we know that they are persistent. They are disguised, they are invisible, they are protean, and they are unscrupulous. They are also very, very skilled. The counter-warfare, law warfare, that has been conducted by inter alia, the public protector, is clear evidence that there is a great deal of skill and a great deal of resource, financial and intellectual, in the counter uh, forces. Now, we're dealing with a hydra headed monster. You cut off a head, you cut off all the heads. You still haven't dealt with the poison that they've left behind. They left seedlings and they grow again. We also know that they have closed ranks, those who were involved. We know that they have left sleepers in many places. We also know that there is a great deal at stake for those who have been targeted and they will fight to the death to preserve their interests and protect their takings. Now, there are three warnings that I want to sound in conclusion. One, in the pursuit of these ill-doers, these evil people, we must be careful not to judicialize the process too much. We will want to be using the courts, yes. You will have to prosecute them or some of them. But that's not all we need to do, not, not all we can do, and that's not all that we should be targeting. Leaving the job for cleaning the stables to the judges alone will mean that the judges will be doing a political job. And sure, as God made little apples, you get judges to do political work, judges get involved in political messes. They get involved in political debate and you de devalue the integrity of the judiciary or at the very <coughs> least you impair its, its image because they are seen as being active political agents. Secondly, there is a natural tendency of colleagues and comrades to gather around. It's commendable. It's a loyalty uh, formed in, in, in battle. Somehow, in what we do, we must be able to counter this understandable and, and possibly even commendable tendency on behalf on the part of comrades to close ranks about those that are being attacked. The I do not believe we have made that moral breakthrough 
and it has to be made. It has to be made clear that we are not attacking people uh, for any reason other than that they have harmed their comrades as well. And then lastly, I would like to paraphrase something that Stephen Friedman said. Uh, he warned in the context of uh, electoral reform, but it's equally a, a opposite here, that uh, the proposals that come forward when we're looking at this kind of issue can be divided into two broad categories. Moral platitudes and institutional tinkering. I'm not sure that we have got beyond that. And I would suggest that at the end of the day, we must do a great deal more than wring our hands and say that what is required is for honesty and purpose and truth to be reestablished. Those are concepts that, uh, that we don't, do not have in our pockets to distribute. And certainly not in the minds and hearts and consciences of others. And secondly, when we start looking at amendments to statutes to regulations, <coughs> let's look deeper than institutional tinkering. Let's actually look to see whether if you change uh, an appointment process from X number of people to Y number of other kinds of people, we are actually addressing the issue. It is easy for us and it is the temptation for us to want to look to that kind of technical resolution of a much deeper and a much more complex issue. With those few words, I wish you a well in the conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Judge, for those uh, words. And I think uh, you have painted uh, the context in which we need to have a discussion now very important uh, concept of uh, lingering, lingering effect of uh, state capture um, and the fact that uh, state capture is much more diverse, much more deep, much more systemic at the provincial level, local level and, and different uh, levels as, as it were. And that uh, there are quite a, a whole range of different uh, features which are different in characteristics. I think the most important issue that we would have to discuss is this uh, issue of uh, impunity, uh, accountability, and the lack of uh, action on the part of uh, the state. But I think we're coming back to this idea of connecting the dots who are continuing with that uh, concept uh, even uh, to today. So that requires uh, different approaches and being cautious in terms of how we deal with the uh, issues. Fear is one issue that has come uh, to the domain. At the end of this meeting, so this idea of rehabilitating institution is something that we need to give flesh to. But your three last warnings are, are very uh, important. One, not to judicialize the process uh, too much. It's very important <laughs> that in recent times, I think we've been going in that direction. And also this idea of uh, moral uh, breakthroughs uh, in the context of comrades uh, closing ranks and thinking that you are attacking them for the sake of it. That's very important. And uh, beyond, what I call beyond institutional it's something that we need to go deeper into. So we're going to spend uh, not too much time because you've just said uh, quite profound uh, things here. Uh, words. I'm sure colleagues here want to maybe uh, ask a question here or maybe also uh, comment there and there. So I'm not going to take two sets of heads. I'm going to take one. One. So, so if I start here, for instance, so that there's nobody. There's one, two, three, four, five, 
six. Um, okay, are we fine? There's no aha moment. Okay, it's fine. It's only fine. Okay, so let's. Uh, <laughs> who is six? Okay, the six whoever is. Okay, but all I know is that there is nobody. This time. Okay, so let's start. Number one. Uh, I thought. Okay, number one. Okay, you you switch. <laughs> Over oh, here. Yeah. Okay, number one, stand up. Good morning. My name is Kate Mawasa. Um, the first is just to underscore um, or an observation that I made with uh, the proceedings this morning. It seems to be a boy's club only, and that's a little bit distasteful. To see men after men after men talking to men, etc. So I don't even understand that before. Um, I, I ask the question. Um, my question is simple. Um, uh, judge, if I have to pick up one thing, one thing as a layman that I can do really to defeat the state capture, as a lay basic man, I'm not really in those levels. What is it? What is it that I can stand up and do today? Thank you. Okay. Number two. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Judge, do we find ourselves at the point of the end of the apartheid corrupt regime and perhaps focus on what we did then and realize that we're not going to be able to fight this as you rightly pointed out in your, in your input to us. Is there not a need for a new party perhaps to win the next election and then deal with the issues at the cold face and perhaps consider an amnesty type of process because like you rightly pointed out we're never going to catch the shenanigans the whole society is corrupt thank you yeah. number three number three yeah um, my name is Dale McKinley from the Right to Know campaign I'm an activist and writer I want to, to put something that it's not just for the judge it's for those who come, because I think the discourse that you're correct in terms of it goes beyond Zuma, it goes beyond the national, but fundamentally, and I raised this with Praveen about a year ago and he got very upset with me, uh, because it's this discourse that somehow state capture started with Zuma. The state capture didn't start in 1994. We have a different kind of state capture that is fundamental to the crisis that we face in South Africa. So yes, it's fundamentally important to do all the things that we've been doing in civil society in terms of accountability, whistleblowers, policy, all these things. But fundamentally, if one, let me just give three examples of in the 1990s, how the state was completely captured, the arms deal, the first deal. Secondly, the billions and billions and billions that were secreted out of this country legally and were allowed to move and not get reinvested. The regulatory capture of the financial services industry and the banking industry and other kinds of things that were, that were happening in the 1990s, such that by the time we got to the 2000s, this, this discourse that we have of that everything was great, that everything was on par, was it's absolute nonsense. There was corruption, deep corruption, already within the state, both at the local level and everything. It was just covered very well, and it was covered because we had growth. And we had a, a, a degree of, of, of uh, competency that, that didn't exist previously. So in the context of this discourse, if we don't address the fundamental developmental path, what is the problem and that feeds the corruption? It's poverty and inequality. Why do we have poverty and inequality? It's not because we have bad individuals in government. It's not because we have bad policies. It's not because we have a bad constitution. It's because we have a bad macroeconomic framework. 
that continues to make sure that we have more inequality, more poverty. If we don't address those things as part of state capture, then what we're going to do is we're going to put new people in, we're going to have new policies, we're going to have new things, but we're not going to fundamentally address what you saw, what you said was the rot, the foundational rot of state capture. What we'll be doing is we'll be putting a nice window dressing, and we'll get new people, and we'll do it again and again, because we're not fundamentally addressing the fundamental patronage system that, fun that, that underlies corruption. And this, to me, is where our debate nationally is missing. And we get dismissed, those of us who raise these things as radicals, as lefties, as everything else. But it's the middle and upper middle class that are the ones that, are, that, are, that, that don't want to face. It's the working class and the poor in this country that have to face the reality of this state capture every single day. And that's where we should be putting our energies and efforts in this case. Not simply in a civil society sort of uh, uh, making the, the walls nicer and painting the rooms nicer, putting on a few more uh, things, that people that would, would uh, how should we say, govern a little bit better. So I just want you to address that. I, want all, I, I would like people in this, in this conference to address that in the context of, because if we don't come to judge, Comrade Judge, if we don't do that, <laughs> then we are, we are, we really are pissing in the wind. Thank you. <laughs> Number four. <clears throat> uh, thank you. My name is John Clark, and I am a friend of the Amadiba, to use a term which, and crocky term in the in a recent piece in the Financial Mail, a social worker worked with the Amadiba community in the Wild Coast for the last 16 years. And it's in that context that the question I want to address actually, in a sense, it's complementary to what Dale said, but different in the sense that I'm looking to the future. And I'm really here to just sound out if there's other people who share my concern, and I'm pleased Deputy Minister John Jeffries is here too, because uh, from my experience of seeing what the devastating effect of state capture on the Amadeva community, notwithstanding that, they have successfully achieved the right to say no to mining and have been able to ensure their free prior and informed consent, thanks to the judiciary, who unfortunately didn't go to ground <laughs> in that instance. And we've got the minister trying to appeal it because he doesn't like the idea of a rural community deciding who gets mining rights. And I said, well, on the evidence of what's happened over the last decade, I, my money is with the rural community knowing what's best for this country because the Department of Mineral Resources and the institutions of government that relate to mining rights have been the primary target of capture. And that's not me who said that. That's the, the, uh, the Minerals Council of South Africa who recognize how Department of Resources was the center of state capture. And I'm not sure we're out of it, because what really concerns me is what legislation exists already and has been passed recently, which further entrenches a climate for capture, namely the traditional court bill and the Khoisan traditional leadership bill, which actually capture traditional leaders so that they can actually have negotiation with third parties, as we saw the Pondo King of the Western Pondoland do earlier this year with the Chinese company to basically sign over a 30 kilometer stretch of the wild coast for the benefit of building a Disney playground and all the rest. So I'm concerned that, is there support for this? Because I'm busy drafting a submission to the Zonda Commission again to say, how do we fireproof the state against recapture or capture again. Well, the first thing seems so self-evident, and I hope it's evident to everybody else, you don't have laws on your statutes which actually like what we've currently got. So I want to see if there's support for that as a part of the recommendation that we make to the Zonda Commission to say, your recommendation, how do we prevent this happening again? Well, we need a whole new set of checks and balances on how traditional leaders behave, uh, how the Department of Resources behave. Because in the context of the nationalization of mineral wealth, well, we've seen it. It makes it, whilst it's such an enlightened policy and a certainly an improvement, it means if you want to get hold of the mineral resources, you simply capture the state because they've got custodianship thereof. And I think that, for me, is about the inequalities of the future, 
for Tailsys, mining has been synonymous with inequality. And are we going to change that? So I think we've got a lot of mineral wealth to work with. I really don't have any confidence in the future unless we deal with that elephant looming in the room. Thank you very much. Number five. Hi, thank you. My name is Letty Prince. I'm a state capture activist, author, and I also assist the state capture commission. But I'm here in my personal capacity. And I want to challenge you a little bit to help us take the thinking forward. You mentioned that Stephen Friedman said, you know, we need to get beyond moral platitudes and um, institutional tinkering. And you also said we can't just leave it up to the judges. And I know you also said that, you know, today part of the point is trying to figure out how we move beyond that. But I'm hoping that you have done some thinking about where, in what dimension does this answer lie? <coughs> Where this, or how this action needs to happen. Six. Let's do something. Oh, okay. That's the last one. <coughs> yeah. So good morning, Judge, and thank you very much for the beautiful delivery. I think we're all most grateful for that. My name is Lionel Greenberg. I sit in the city of Johannesburg on the Impact Committee, which deals with essentially all the corruption which is, surrounds the city of Joburg. Uh, if you were to indemnify everybody for their wrongdoing, Judge, uh, or we all adopted that, how do we rebuild the moral fabric of society and re and regroup and have consequence management for people who don't seem to want to understand? that we can't go forward. And for a simple example, if I was to be specific, from the taxi on the road to people who are assaulting our JMPD officers, for people who have no respect for our police, and the reciprocal responsibility of police being uprighteous and, and trying to uphold the cornerstones of our constitution. I think